All right. All right, John. So on, on a personal level, what was the experience like living in the US with your family? Uh, and, and now you're back in the UK, obviously working for NBC Sports, calling some of the, the biggest Premier League matches uh, every weekend. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's very nice to be back because this is this is home. But I had five terrific years in the US. Um, I mean, in, in, in some ways, I'm sad that it wasn't longer. Um because when I signed up, I signed a five-year contract with with ESPN, and I think in the full expectation that probably ESPN and MLS was a partnership that was going to move forward for a, a fair amount of time to come. Um, so a little sad that it was cut short, but equally, I've got so many memories and very fond memories of my my time in the US and of meeting so many new people, of having to learn a a, a league completely from scratch of being embraced, really, by people in the soccer community across your vast nation. Um, so I have only really got fond memories of the of the whole experience. And it's something that I'm just so glad that I was, if I say brave enough to do, that makes it sound like a, 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 a an awfully difficult decision. It, it wasn't. But I did have people over on this side of the pond saying, why are you going there uh, at the stage that I did? So I, I had to fight those inner demons, but I'm so glad that I did it because... I've now got something on my resume that that virtually no one else has doing what I do. And and I feel better for it, both as an individual and as a broadcaster as well, because the way of doing soccer on TV in the United States is wildly different to the way that it's done in Europe. And so I had to adjust and, and learn those techniques. I, I had to become a face as well as a voice. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that, I'm just immensely grateful for. So you have the best of both worlds. If I remember correctly, you live in the Cotswolds area. Yes. in the UK, and, and then uh, having lived in the US, uh, working for ESPN, of course. What are some of the things you miss personally about, about the US now that you're li back in li living in the UK? Well, uh, on a very self-indulgent note, my favourite bar. So I lived in a place called Brookline, Massachusetts, where the golf course is. So three miles out of downtown Boston, which was a city that my wife and I, my youngest son, who came to finish high school uh, in the US, quickly learnt to love. And um, to start with, I was there on my own for for six months whilst my son finished his school year and my wife stayed with him over here in the, the UK. And so I was sort of looking for local contacts and friends and place to go and have a, a decent beer. And I found a place called The Abbey in on Beacon Street in Brookline, which um, I think is run, it's, it's run by an Irish guy who's been in the US for 30 years, a mysterious Irish guy who I, I don't think I ever met in five years, a very regular custom. Um, but I was sort of embraced by these people uh, and they, they were big soccer fans. Um, mm -hmm. So that was my sort of go-to place. So the first thing that I miss about the US is that. The second thing I think I miss is the travel, uh, which may sound a bit weird, but um, I rather miss getting on a plane at Logan Airport in Boston every Friday, flying to the other side of a vast continent, calling a game and coming back three days later. I got into those rhythms. I enjoyed the travel. I enjoyed seeing the, the great cities of the United States. So I miss that too. And once I start to get a break in my schedule over here, I'm sure I'll be I'll be back in the US touring around and, and meeting old friends. So I miss that. I miss the can-do attitude, Chris. Mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that uh, in the US, if you've got a, a glass of beer in front of you and you're halfway down, it, it's regarded as being half full, whereas here it's regarded as being half empty. And it's just a way of thinking. But I think it's representative of that American dream that in the US you can, in theory, achieve anything and do anything. And it's it's quite nice. There's no tall poppy syndrome that I experienced in the US. Whereas if you are seen to have succeeded in whatever field in the UK, there is a tendency of people to try and knock you down. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, they just celebrate you and the people around you for what you are, what you've done, what you can give, what you contribute. And, and I, I miss that attitude too. So the transition from calling it MLS games for ESPN to the Premier League and calling games for NBC Sports. So obviously, we've we, we hear you hear you now and again in the past, and even in currently, right? In terms of um, like some some other matches like League Cup and other matches. Yeah. Um, what's that transition been like in terms of uh, and and your experience working with NBC Sports for the Premier League this season? Well, working with NBC Sports has been great. It's not an entirely new experience for me in that before I left in early 2019 to go to, to the US, I'd worked for Premier League Productions since its inception. And from 2013, when NBC got the US rights, they were the, the major client of Premier League Productions. So although in that six-year spell up to 2019, I wasn't working 
directly for them very often. I was contributing to their programs and Pierre Moussa, their coordinating producer, would frequently be in touch asking me to contribute to one of their documentaries, maybe over something historic in the Premier League, or maybe to do a, a stand up from pitch side before a game. So I had those contacts with Pierre and his number two, Adam Littlefield. So I knew what NBC were all about, but obviously I'd been out of that environment for, for five years in the US. So coming back, I've had to learn to work a bit harder because there are more games to do. So my schedule now is calling the top game on a Saturday for Premier League productions to go right around the world and the top game on a Sunday and occasionally on a Monday for NBC. And then as you rightly identify, I still have a relationship with ESPN whereby I'll call the Carabao Cup and the FA Cup when those rounds come round. Um, I also have a, a contract with Amazon uh, Prime Video in the US. They mm -hmm. have two rounds of the the Premier League, and then in a year's time, they take on board part of the UEFA Champions League. And hopefully I'll be doing the Euros for ITV next summer. So there's lots of constituent parts to my life now, whereas before I just waited for a paycheck once a week from one employer. Now I'm genuinely freelance and having to send out invoices and boring office things like that. <laughs> but it's it's great fun. And it's it's been easier to slip back into this than it was to go to the United States into a completely new environment, because I'm it's like putting on an old slipper again, coming back here. So, so both you and Peter Drury uh, call some of the biggest games in the Premier League. Uh, have you had any um, experiences working with Peter in the past, uh, other broadcasters or any uh, any other stories in regards to that? Um, just a bit, Chris. Yeah, I mean, we're, <laughs> we are amongst each other's oldest friends. So although we've been seen as sort of competing broadcasters, I suppose, by, by many people as rivals for, for many years, in fact, we get on tremendously well. Uh, and that goes back some over 30 years. So when we were both starting out in local radio with the BBC together, so I was lucky enough to get my first staff job out of university um, with BBC Radio Leeds, a mm -hmm. city in the north of England, 200 miles north of London. It was just at the time when Leeds United were becoming good again, having been the side of the late 60s and early 70s. They'd had a long fallow period, fallen into what's now the championship, then the second division. Uh, they had a manager called Billy Bremner, who was a famous Scot, who uh, was in charge when I took this job at Radio Leeds, and then he was followed by Howard Wilkinson. And in fact, Leeds United went on to win the last Football League title before the Premier League started in 1992. So I was there in the late 80s. I left at the end of 1989 to go to BBC Radio Network Sport in London. It was then Radio 2. It's now Radio 5 Live. Uh, and at that point, uh, I'd become very friendly with uh, one of the other young broadcasters there, Miles Harrison, who went on to become the voice of rugby on Sky Television and is currently out at the, the Rugby World Cup in France on behalf of ITV. And then when I left, they took on a young broadcaster by the name of Peter Drury, who mm -hmm. I'd got to know in the, the previous months because he was very keen to get into broadcasting. He was working for Haters News Agency in London at the time. Uh, and so we go back to then, yes, 1989, 1990. Over the years, we've worked for the same organisation on occasions. So we called the 1996 Champions League final in Rome together, Ajax and Juve for Radio 5 Live. Then we worked together at ITV for the best part of a, a decade. Then we were colleagues on the Premier League World Feed. And now happily, we're colleagues again. So I'm able to see far more of, of, of him and him of me than has been the case for the last five years. We're godfathers to each other's children. And in fact, here's a, a, a little insight into our fairly humdrum lives. Next Wednesday, both of us have great reason to thank David Pleat, the former Tottenham manager, for many things in our careers. He was one of the very best co-commentators that either of us have ever worked with. And David's now 78. He's not been in the best of health, but happily he's improving again. Still working for Tottenham as a scout yeah. uh, and going to all sorts of games. And so Peter and I are taking him out for lunch next Wednesday just to uh, to go over old times. So it's lovely to be able to, to do things like that again. Out of curiosity, I, I mean, Ian Dark has done boxing for, for many, many, many years. Have you ever done any any broke, any commentary outside of soccer? I have, yeah. I mean, I did three Olympic Games for the BBC, doing the swimming and the okay. ceremonies. Um, I did three years of a programme called Test Match Special, which is a famous cricket radio show in mm -hmm. this country, uh, which, is, which is much loved. I did Wimbledon. I did the university boat race, the rowing. Um, so I've, I have a, a wide range. I've done two Rugby World Cups for network television in the, the UK. That's Rugby Union, the 15 aside code. I also did a Rugby League World Cup for the BBC. So the old multi-sport programme that they had called Grandstand. When I was a young football broadcaster coming through working with John Motson and Barry Davis, two of the greats on Match of the Day, 
uh, also to fill out my schedule they used to give me the rugby league to do because I came from the north of England which is the heartland of that particular game so yeah. quite often I'd call a a first division or latterly a Premier League game for a match of the day on a Saturday and then be going to somewhere like Widnes or Wigan or Warrington most of them started with W to call <laughs> a rugby league game live on the TV on a Sunday in my early years. Interesting. So, so just this recently, uh, of course, the VAR controversy in England. Uh, yeah. I mean, the one example of many, but the, the Spurs against Liverpool match. And one thing we learned as as viewers was that uh, oftentimes that the commentators in the year can actually hear the, the kind of the decision in terms of check complete from, from the uh, the VAR officials. Yeah. Um, th does that happen in Major League Soccer also, or is, or is that just the Premier League, as far as you know? Um, the Premier League is pretty good at giving you a feed. You only get half of the conversation, though, Chris. I should point that out. You're only allowed to hear the VAR talking to the referee. So mm -hmm. you don't hear the referee's response to the VAR. And on that subject, it's been very interesting. The last two games I've done, I did Fulham Chelsea Monday of last week, and then I was doing Arsenal Manchester City on Sunday. And mm -hmm. on both occasions, I had the, the bleed of the VAR, and the language has changed beyond recognition over the last 10 days. It's much more concise now. There's no room for any doubt in terms of what they're looking at, what they're looking for and what the conclusion is and the communication of the decision at the end. It's almost like they're reading from a scripted template. So it's it's changed yeah. an awful lot. It's a lot less matey than that tape that we were all privy to last week from yeah. the, uh, the, the Tottenham Liverpool game. So that's changed. Um, but no, we were given good insights into to VAR with Major League Soccer, but we didn't have the VAR in our ear. But what, what we did have was uh, a lot of communication from Howard Webb when he was running the Referees Association in the United States and a commitment for openness and transparency and a willingness to put his hands up on behalf of his organisation and say, we got it wrong. And that's what we're getting in the UK now, which I think is welcome. But I think it's, it's awkward for Howard because he's still working with people that he inherited from the past regime he hasn't really had long enough to get everyone thinking in his way yet so there are bound to be some some bumps in the road and goodness me last week was a major one yeah i'm curious uh do you miss putting uh taylor twelman in his place as the brash american oh dear me i mean i just whether he's a brash american or not i just miss putting taylor twelman in his place whether that's on the television <laughs> in an airport in a bar in a restaurant it became great sport um, mm -hmm. He, in all seriousness, though, he was one of the major reasons I went to the US. So my relationship with ESPN originally was a calling Premier League games in the UK when they had a UK arm and UK rights. And then the first thing I did for the US arm of ESPN was the 2014 World Cup. And that was when I first met Taylor and allied to my little contract for doing that was coming over to the US and doing some of the summer soccer friendly. So yeah. I toured around after the World Cup with Taylor and got to know him really well. And it was then that he was agitating, saying, look, come and come and work over here. And it took five years before it happened. And he and his family, they lived just outside Boston and they were just so welcoming. So I think two or three times for Thanksgiving, when I was on my own in the US, I spent Thanksgiving with the Twelmans. Mm -hmm. um, they were wonderfully kind. And he was very generous in terms of opening up his contacts book so that I mm -hmm. quickly got to know all the, the movers and shakers in the American soccer scene that I needed to know. So I've got a lot to be thankful to him for, but part of our fun traveling around the country was winding him up uh, because it's just too easy. Yeah, and it was fun for us, us the, the viewers watching the matches, listening to the commentary, hearing kind of that banter back and forth. Uh, in some ways, it's interesting too, because it's almost like two opposites attract, right? Kind of for you as, as a witty, dry, humoured uh, English person of you mean much experience, Taylor's kind of the brash American, kind of quick-witted, but also... From a diff completely diff different path. Um, Chris, let me let me help you, Chris. You're saying that he's cool and I'm not. And that's basically <laughs> where we're getting to here. But I I, su I suppose yes, yeah. Maybe, maybe opposites do attract. But he was one of the very best that I've worked with, and um, I I think you know he. Well, we've seen on Apple, haven't we? We've seen on the Apple MLS project just how important and integral Taylor is. You know, when he's in that studio, it's a different place on the odd occasion they've have him in. Um, when you listen yeah. to him doing a game, he's absolutely on it. You know, no one, no one is quicker that I've worked with at picking up uh, a potential offside, particularly in the VAR, VAR era, where what you're seeing in the moment is not necessarily the whole story. He's mm -hmm. wonderfully quick and perceptive at picking up those moments. So yeah. it's very easy, I think, for people rather snobbishly to listen to an American co-com 
And this mm. used to make me quite angry, actually. I, I'd read critiques of Taylor and people having a go at him, really on the basis of his accent. And that it's it's crazy, because if you listen to the content, the accent shouldn't matter. If you listen to the content, he is terrific. Yeah, especially the way he reads the game, too. And after yeah. times, he, he's almost predicting and, what's going to happen before it and, does happen. And Chris, he knows he knows the TV world. When, mm. when his career was finished at 28 by the, the issue with serial concussions, not only did he embrace the, the charity that he now runs, the foundation, um, in terms of, of promoting knowledge and wisdom about head injuries, particularly in sports and how they should be dealt with and how sports people should be protected if they've suffered one of these. But he also decided, right, if I'm going to do telly, I'm going to do it properly. So he went and learnt the nuts and bolts of a television outside broadcast. And what's particularly impressive is you turn up at any ground around the country and our crew would vary. There'd be a core crew, five or six cameramen you'd see every week. The sound guy, DC Tong from Texas. We always had DC. We'd know him, but he would know the names of all the crew, Taylor. Yeah. Uh, and he would greet them warmly and they would be equally warm back to him because he cared about it and it shows. Yeah, the very first game he was a co-commentator co for for ESPN was uh, San Jose Earthquakes against Tottenham Hotspur. And I remember like writing something or, or tweeting something and I got an email back from him, like, tell me more, like, why do you think this? Why do you think that? So over the years, he's been very, very open to kind of feedback and criticism or yeah. just opinion just so that he can understand what others think which which is which is a great quality which is a lot of people don't don't wouldn't do that I, no. i'm wondering i'm wondering too so, so opposites do attract but but where do you get your witty dry sense of humor from is it is, is that <laughs> family uh television you mean know, english culture where is that from hey oh, you're asking me to sort of self-analyze which is always a very uncomfortable place to be chris i i i really don't know i suppose i mean people do say to me you're very english and I think they mean it in a nice way. I'm not always not always sure, but I do quite like that dry, understated humour. That's the stuff that makes me laugh. If I if I go to a comedy club, um, or I go to you know the Apollo Theatre in London, which is famous for its comedy, co comedy and watch a show, it, it's that dry, understated humour that makes me roar and fall out of my seat. So mm. I'm not suggesting mine is anything like that level, but I suppose that's that's what appeals to me. Yeah, because sometimes I'm listening to your commentary, laughing to myself, you know, as far as watching the match or just just laughing at the humour uh, and then thinking like Monty Python, Faulty Towers, you mean, kind of... I, uh, I love that. Uh, porridge. Oh, yes. Porridge, yeah. Porridge, yes, Minister. Porridge, yes, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all, of, all of those things and, and several more. That probably dates me as well, Chris, because all the <laughs> things you're talking about from the, the 1970s and 80s. I'm not that old, but you're making me feel it. So, so... After ESPN and, and, and MLS and, and before NBC and the Premier League, mm -hmm. um, there was a, a period of time where you were kind of in between. Um, and from yes. what I understand, uh, you traveled the United States going to Major League Soccer games, yes. um, not for work, but for pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that journey like? It, it was always some of those experiences. And where did you go and, and, and why? Um, all over the place. It was great. It was lovely to be able to watch a game with a beer for once. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Minnesota a couple of times, so it's quite a sad time for Adrian Heath at the moment, having lost his job, but he's he's a long-term friend of mine, so I would go and see him, and uh, my wife Anna would come along, and we'd go and see him and his wife Jane in their lovely home at, on Lake Minnetonka. Um, uh, where else did I? I went to Portland. Um, I got to, to know a guy called Steve Schroeder, who's the club doctor uh, mm -hmm. at the Portland Timbers, who is the most magnificently generous host uh, and is a wine buff. And I, I'm not a wine buff, but he introduced me to the vineyards of Oregon. So we had a, a, a great trip there. Uh, I enjoyed going down to Nashville to see people there. I was sort of partially responsible for Tony Husband uh, coming mm -hmm. over to work in, in this country, uh, in that Nashville were looking for a, a commentator two or three years ago and asked me if I could put them in touch with anyone that I thought might be interested. And um, that so that's a, a relationship that's grown. So we went to see him and his wife and took in a game there. So yes, we we dotted around the the US, it was it was lovely to go without not the pressure of work, but without knowing that you got to spend the previous evening in a hotel room doing your notes. So what about I mean, so your club, your childhood club, uh, still a supporter of York City FC, uh, lots of changes in, in the last probably decade in terms of mm. uh, leave, leaving uh, Booth and Crescent, going to a new ground uh, in the National League. Um, so now being back in the UK, are you getting to go to, to York City matches a little bit more than, than you would have done in the past? I will do. I haven't been this season. 
I, I took in a couple of games at the new stadium at the tail end of last season when I happened to be over in the in the country. And it's very nice, but there's uh, there's no comparison with the old one. The old ground for for listeners and viewers that wouldn't be aware of a club as lowly as York was a place called Bootham Crescent. And York is a historic Roman city. And the centrepiece of York is its beautiful cathedral, the Minster. And Bootham Crescent was only 10 minutes walk from the central point, the Minster. So um, it was a very sort of sociable ground to go to in that there were lots of pubs along the way. York is also famous for having a pub for every day of the year. Um, and I, my formative experiences were watching football at Bootham Crescent. So in my lifetime, I've seen this tiny club beat Arsenal in the FA Cup. I've seen them beat Manchester City in the league. Think of that. A side mm -hmm. in the National League now beating the current treble holders in a league match as supposed equals. I've seen Manchester United beaten in a cup. I've seen Chelsea beaten in a cup. I've seen Everton beaten in a cup. So I've got wonderful memories of that ground in particular. And it was also where I saw my first ever professional football match back in the, the mid-1970s as a, a boy in short trousers. So to be uprooted and moved to an industrial park four miles outside the city is quite a harsh experience. But I'm just relieved that the club's still going. Because like so many clubs at that level, it's had its moments where its very existence has been threatened. Uh, I mean, I remember nearly 20 years ago organising an event in York and getting Steve McLaren along because Steve is another native of, of York. And at that time, he was riding high at Manchester United on his way to become the England manager, which, as we know, didn't turn out so well. But we had a big function to, to just to raise money to keep the club going. So it's come a long way since then. But they are in the fifth division um, they, they are, there are new owners uh, mm -hmm. who I'm hopeful of because they've got deep pockets. I, I just hope that they know what they're spending their money on and how they should spend it. Because I'm rather alarmed to see that in the National League, we have a first team squad of 36 players at the moment, which strikes me as probably twice as many as we should have. But um, I think they're still bedding in the new owners. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how the National League has become very attractive in terms of even from the US in terms of people following it, uh, interested in the clubs, mm -hmm. whether it's Dorking Wanderers or even previously Wrexham or, or Notts County, York City. I mean, I think a lot more American soccer fans can name teams in the National League than they could have done a couple of years ago, thanks to to Wrexham and, and, and their documentary. Yeah, there's there's very little, if anything, to choose between the standard of League Two and, and the National League. And in fact, mm -hmm. many players in the National League are, are probably better players and are better paid than those in the in the league above because there is such a chase for success and for promotion out of that national league that there will always be two or three owners every year throwing serious money uh, at, at the situation but what you do get with football at that level in this era where the premier league sucks so much uh, mm -hmm. out of the the environment of football because it takes so much of the attention if you go to a national league or even a league one or league two game you can still uh, the phrase i use is you can still taste the bodril and you can smell the liniment because mm. those are the two formative experiences I remember from my first ever football match, walking past the back of the main stand at York City on the way to watch them play Newport County in the old fourth division. And I was handed a drink, which was this horrible beef drink called Bovril, which, as you would know, was very popular at the time in, in, in the UK. And then as we walked past the back of the stand, you could see through the windows into the dressing rooms and this smell, this violent smell of sort of Raljex came out of the uh, the open window. And that was the liniment that the players were rubbing on their limbs ahead of the, the game to keep them supple and avoid injury. So um, I think if you go to the National League, you still get those basic experiences. It, it's okay. football you can feel and you can touch. It's not glamorised at all. The last question I have is about uh, your experience commentating top flight in English football uh, through different decades. Obviously, the VAR controversy has been pretty hardcore in terms of... Um, the level of just just frustration but in previous decades has there been anything else like this that has caused so, so much strife or so much uh i mean that you get kind of two crowds kind of those who want to get rid of var completely or mm. those who want to keep it but maybe fine-tune it but can, can you think of any any other controversies in terms of um it affecting the game itself in previous uh in previous times not in the same way chris but i mean i have lived and worked through the era where english fans were banned from europe for example right. so issues such as that and when i first started broadcasting in the 1980s it was a dirty thing to say you were involved in football it was mm -hmm. the time of the thatcher government i think she would very happily have probably closed the entire professional football industry down if she could have done um, a lot of grounds were playing with uh, fences around them uh, a lot of clubs were playing with fences around them so the 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 um the fans were treated almost like prisoners 
within the grounds. Uh, you walked out of a football ground in fear of what might happen, particularly late at night, whether you'd get embroiled in some fight. Um, going on public transport to and from football matches was not a clever thing to do in those eras. So there was almost an existential threat to the game then. So this is pretty minor by comparison, yeah. but it's it's no less annoying. Um, and you said quite rightly that it's a polarising issue. There are two camps. I was pretty vocal when this was being brought in five, six years ago in saying I didn't want it. So mm. I don't feel I'm I'm being after the event or using hindsight to say I told you so. And it gives me no pleasure to do so. But I just think that football is a game of human frailty. And that goes for the officials as well as the players. And that we've just added a layer of complication and a layer of frustration that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. Now, because we were presented with VAR as a catch-all, mend-all, fix-all solution. And of course, it's not. And it was never going to be. Um, so I just think we're in a, a, a an awkward, frustrating place. And it's interesting, actually, talking to Peter Drury last week at, uh, ahead of Arsenal, we were just discussing VAR. And I think both of us would probably do away with it, given the chance. But as commentators, the biggest frustration of all is that you can be going into the 95th minute of a rip-roaring... Premier League, MLS game, doesn't matter what the competition is, but the game has gripped you for 90 minutes. And then you get the pinnacle moment, or so you think, in the 95th minute where someone goes upfield and scores the clinching goal. And you go do Lally, and so do the crowd. And then two minutes later, after lengthy, mysterious delays over which there's very little communication, you find out that, in fact, what you've just seen and celebrated didn't actually happen at all. And I don't see how you can present professional entertainment in that manner it's a bit like right. asking someone to pay an awful lot of money to go to a broadway show and there's a very intricate plot and just as you get into the punchline at the end the manager comes out draws the curtains across and says sorry we're not going to tell you what happens because that's mm -hmm. basically the equivalent in a dramatic sense to what's happening with var at the moment in a in a match deciding moment and that yeah. can't be right yeah, and when I think about it now that you say it, in terms of some of my best memories of football from over the you know, decades that I've been following it, it's those moments where that goal goes into the back of the net and the celebrations. For me, it would be Alan Curtis, mm. for Swansea City against Leeds United, August uh, 1981, first game of the uh, first division. And that, and I was right there, right in the terracing, right yeah. by in front of the fence, being kind of pinned in, but... That moment will live, live with me forever. So if that was pulled back because a bar was back in the day, I would have been just, just yeah. devastated, destroyed. It's also the fact, Chris, that when that put yourself in that position, say that game had VAR and you're uh -huh. there as that Swansea fan, and that happens, you know, you were 100% all in on it, I presume, when that happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, as a fan, however rabid a fan, you'd only be... 75% in because the first thought would be, hey, that's brilliant. And then the second thought, two seconds later, would be, hang on, is that actually going to count? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of brilliant, John, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. It's been a pleasure catching up and I really enjoyed the chat and best of luck for the rest of the Premier League season with NBC Sports. Thank you very much, Chris. It's always great to talk to you. Um, yeah. Love World Soccer Talk. And um, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you.